I'll just briefly introduce myself. So my name's Joy Evans. I'm part of a small church, um, part of the FIEC in Gateshead. Um, I've been asked to introduce you to Liz, who's leading this seminar, and then to wrap up at the end to make sure that you get your lunch. So, um, as I've said, there's a thankfulness for that in the crowd. Um, as I've said, Liz's seminar is um, to be packed through for the full um, time. So we've got a quick, quick fire question to introduce you. Quick fire. Thanks. Quick fire. I'll be quick. So um, morning routine this morning, Liz. Tea, coffee, well made. <laughs> Any specific order. She's a bit dodgy about this because we used to be housemates 100 years ago and she, uh, she doesn't drink tea and she made me a cup of tea once. She made me cups of tea for weeks, months, years and I said that I did, after about three years, I told her she didn't make it very nicely. <laughs> so it's a bit touchy because I like two cups of tea in the morning and then I go on to coffee. My children say that my parenting is driven by caffeine. Um, so I am, I've got my little coffee there that I probably will kick over. Uh, but then no more coffee after noon. No more coffee after noon. No more caffeine after noon. Okay, so I don't drink tea or coffee, but if you know me well, there's generally a Diet Coke in my bag for my parents to be fueled by caffeine too. Um, so, how has your prep been ahead of this seminar? Are you to the wire, or have you been planned in advance and having a relaxing week? <laughs> um, I'm a, I like, I like a little bit of adrenaline to keep me going. So I, I would admit I'm a little bit to the wire. We had some people over for dinner last night and uh, I came down, did dinner, crept away, came back for pudding. So yeah, a little bit to the wire. Uh, so not fully finished this morning, still time for tea and coffee and a little reflection. Yeah, yeah. But not a spelling lesson, which we'll come back to in a minute. <laughs> um, so a busy mum of three vibrant children, wife of an archaeologist, always a good measure for the gag of yeah, appreciating yeah. things as they get older and more broken. Uh, <laughs> um, Half but true. So in the planning, how's it been? Do you seek out the children when it's ominously quiet or do they seek you out for love, affection and a food offer more than cereal? Well, I, we have had a lot of cereal eating, <laughs> I have to say. There's been, I, I've neglected the hoovering and I've uh, neglected a uh, a few <laughs> home cooked meals. Um, I do like to creep away, uh, but they find me. I do. I have been saying to the children quite often in the last couple of weeks, "You have two parents." I don't know if that's a common refrain that other people say, but uh, that has come out quite often these last couple of weeks. I am not in charge of this domain. That is your father, is <laughs> yeah, what yeah, I yeah. say when it comes to orthodontistry or swimming. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, finally. Um, I know you'll have read much of God's Word, that your um, prep will be thorough and you love to read, um, but have you been permitted a little allowance for 10 of those and what have you got your eye on? Well, it's interesting you say that because I actually lost my bank card yesterday, so uh, my friend Hilary had to pay for the parking <laughs> and joy. We might be going up to 10 of those together. Um, I've got cash. Excellent, turn off. Amazing, yeah. Because that, that's the thing, is it's like uh, 10 of those I think is like Ikea. You go in to spend £10 and you come out spending more. I've got my eye on that Karen Saul book, oh, I yeah. think. I love reading about gender and women and all that stuff, so I think that might be a purchase of another book about women and the church and Christianity, that looks good. Brilliant. And um, if anybody's been watching The Apprentice this week, you will see that there was a fatal flaw in the branding. And similarly, Liz has kept in tune with culture and contemporary Christianity. So worshiping is spelled with two Ps, thank Liz, you, not you. one. You'll spot it on the handout. Um, let me pray before we start. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of meeting together around your word. And Father, we thank you for that insight we saw into the Lord Jesus um, revealed through John 4. And we simply ask that you would turn our eyes to Jesus. Please be with Liz as she speaks. And please challenge and change our hearts, we pray, for your sake. Amen. Amen. I will take the microphone. <laughs> Do you want your hand up? Yep, I want my hand up. I'm putting the P in there. Excellent, yes. Thanks for pointing that out for the second time. Um, it's so nice uh, that you've joined us for this seminar, and it's so nice that Elspeth has uh, set us up with that John 4 passage, and we've got a chance 
isn't that lovely? We've got a bit chance to think a bit longer about what it means to worship God from uh, John 4. We're going to jump around the Bible. That's why I've got my eye on the clock. So, um, and we're going to have some small group work as well. So we might need a bit of uh, shuffling around, but it's great to have you with us. I wonder what you think um, when you hear the word worship. Are you into Wordle? Anybody? I've done it this morning already, half six. I didn't mention that after my first cup of tea, before my second one, I did it. I won't tell you the answer. But, and this is, uh, I put it in a Wordle frame, but it's not Wordle. But I thought you could uh, come to me afterwards if you don't know what Wordle is, and this, I'll introduce you to the next stage of life and procrastination. But um, uh, there on your sheet, you've got a little space to write down what words you think of when you hear the word worship. So just off the top of your head, what words, and they don't have to be... Uh, that number of uh, letters either. But what words do you think of when you hear the word worship? I think, keep, think, keep writing them if you want to, but I think it's a word um, that's, it's kind of a hard to avoid word uh, when you think about worship in modern day Christianity. I think we, it immediately conjures up uh, certain things. I think it conjures up what we do on Sundays. Uh, of course, it conjures up uh, music and singing. I think it also conjures up the idea of passion and the heart, uh, the emotions. I wonder if you had any words around those. Uh, but actually, when you look more closely, like we have this morning with John 4, the word worship encompasses uh, so much more. And if we just sit with this narrow definition of thinking about music and Sunday and worship times, uh, we do miss out on its full meaning. And I think, importantly, we miss out on a fundamental aspect of the Christian life. Uh, we know that from this morning, because our worship is to our God. And as we've heard, God is looking for true worshippers. So I'm going to say today, we need to go big with our understanding of worship. Do you have that phrase in your houses? Go big or go home? I'm just saying, we need to go big with our understanding of worship. And we need to avoid, I think, two dangers. We need to avoid being too narrow and just thinking about worship as in music and singing and also just thinking about worship as kind of the passionate side of church the emotional side uh, we need to avoid thinking about just getting caught up in song and praise I mean I've looked forward to the music this morning I think they've been putting some Facebook pointers onto new songs I've loved that I've got a Spotify playlist of Christian music that my children laughed at, laugh at they say it's just hipsters with acoustic guitars um, which is true, but the danger is uh, when we feel, when we just have it like that too narrow, we feel the passion and emotion in Sundays at church, and we feel close to God, but then afterwards there's the come down. And in the week, the day to day, it feels perhaps a little bit less good than singing all together in Stockton Baptist or in church on Sunday. And the struggle and the weariness of the day to day, and the distance from the keenness and passion on a Sunday worship experience. Uh, feels less good. Uh, perhaps we even means we put living for God on a back burner until we enjoy the worship on the Sunday. And in a way, that's a bit skewed thinking, and so we need to go big with our understanding of worship. And the second danger, I think, is that we, um, if we only tie it into what we do on Sunday or with music, then we also end up just focusing on ourselves, what we're doing towards God, our feelings like upward. And worship almost becomes like us hailing God's attention or even favor towards us. And that's the danger too, seeing worship in the wrong direction, just always thinking upwards. Because actually what we're going to learn about from John 4 and from the Bible today, God is reaching down to us. And if we keep thinking upwards, upwards, how can I reach God? How can I get into the presence of God? Uh, how can I feel connected and feel something? That's a lot of effort. And it's skewed thinking, so we do need to go big on our understanding of worship. And we need to widen our understanding to what Jesus says about being true worshippers. So Jesus says, go big. I think that's what he's saying in John 4. Worship is, worship is no longer, like we heard this morning, about a place to find God, but it's finding God in a person, in Jesus. That's getting the direction right, isn't it? God in Jesus, um, him stepping into our world and searching for us. I've got on the sheet three Greek words that are used in the Greek Old Testament 
and in the New Testament that describes worship. And when we even see that there's three words, not one, there's actually four, but I went for three. Uh, when there's three words, not one, we begin to see that it is uh, not narrow and it is broader. Um, so proscunio, this is as good as the Welsh, I'll try that later. That one is the word that's in John 4 that we heard this morning, and that means homage and adoration, that side of paying a kiss to someone who's greater than us. Sabomii means reverence, and that's often used in Acts for the God-fearers that feared God, had a reverence. And latrio is often used by Paul about service and obedience. Um, that's Romans 12, verse 1. That's also in many of the verses in Revelation that are talking about praising Jesus in heaven. And so even that shows us that we shouldn't be too narrow, and I think in straight away we can see that it's a broader idea. And so I've come up with a definition of worship from the Bible, um, I think, that helps us avoid those dangers, and it's on um, the sheet. I've said it's God dwelling among his people to reveal and redeem, and then our response in worship is grateful worship, total devotion, service and adoration, heart, mind and action. I think I could have made that more snappy, but I didn't. There we go. God dwells amongst his people to reveal and redeem. Worship is primarily relational. It's not just what we do and it's not just what we sing. God is reaching down to us to reveal himself and to redeem us. And our response is grateful worship, total devotion. So we are going to journey, as we go big, we're going to journey back into the Old Testament to get a better understanding. Two reasons why we're going to go back into the Old Testament, and this is when I'm going to start talking fast, um, is we're going to avoid being narrow. Uh, John 4 refers us back to the Old Testament when it talks about uh, Jerusalem and worshipping God in a place. Um, and we're going to avoid looking at worship from the wrong direction. We'll see when we look at the Old Testament that God acts constantly through history to uh, reach out to us, to reveal himself and to redeem us. And uh, that's what we're going to do. What I'm going to let you do now is just, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Old Testament stuff. I'm going to go through it quite quickly. And then after that, we are going to just go into some groups to do some activity and to talking. So I wonder, just while I get my next bit of notes, whether you want to shuffle around, especially if you're sitting on your own, and perhaps uh, make sure you're in a group uh, with some people so perhaps shuffle around if you don't want to be in a group and you just want to listen that's also right but this is a just this is a good idea um and perhaps uh maybe even rearranging of chairs thank you Elspeth Lovely, lovely, lovely. I love a murmur. If you turn over your sheet, you'll see on the next side um, that we've got a bit of a, a timeline. So um, in the passage this morning, the woman said, Sir, to Jesus, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So we're just going to do a little flip journey through the Old Testament, see what she was alluding to. And we're going to start in the first dwelling place, the Garden Temple in Eden. Because we see from the very beginning how God creates a good, good world where he dwells with his people. Man and woman are made in his image, blessed with the goodness of that great garden. And according to Genesis uh, 2 verse 15, they're to work and to keep it. But more than that, and it's really striking, uh, God, man and woman enjoy each other's presence. It's full open access worship. He's not a distant hidden God watching things unfold from afar, but God is with them, face-to-face, -face, open access. And we see it in the verse that I've got on the screen. Now, the context, of course, is so, but it's when things have gone wrong. It's when Adam and Eve have disobeyed God. But these are such poetic, relational verses. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool. And the man and the woman hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to man, and he said to them, Where are you? The Lord is walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The presence of the Lord is with Adam and Eve. The Lord God calls to man and woman. So the Bible starts with God being amongst his people who give him devotion and service. God has reached out from his heavenly place for Adam and Eve to know him. God is dwelling 
uh, with his pe people. And so the awfulness of Adam and Eve's disobedience is that they leave that place where God dwells with them, where God walks with them in the cool of the evening. They leave that place from the presence of the Lord. They are to leave the place where the Lord God calls to them. They no longer dwell with God. And so the journey continues outside the garden. And so we move away from the garden. And in Genesis still, we do jump to the mountains and Abraham. And we've got um, how God reaches out to Abraham. The story doesn't stop with Adam and Eve. Again, no hidden, distant God, but one who initiates relationship. God reaches out to reveal himself to Abraham and to promise relationship and commitment to be his God. And what's interesting about Abraham in the stories uh, in Genesis 12 onwards, Abraham's told to mark his experience of God by place. It's not Eden, but it's still a place where God is dwelling with his people, with Abraham. Multiple times we see Abraham build an altar, and there's a fire, and there's a sacrifice. The place where God reaches down to people from heaven is to be marked uh, altars of sacrifice and worship. So God is reaching out, redeeming and revealing himself in a place. And Abraham is marking those different places where heaven reaches earth. And Abraham is worshipping there. And again, again, God moves his promises forward. You see the same, Jacob do the same thing in Genesis 35. And of course, as we go into the next book, Exodus, and Moses and the people of Israel, we see a more substantial marking of place, which is the tabernacle. Let me just flick my slide. Oops, the right direction. I feel like my teenage daughter's tutting in my ear and my inability to use a, a clicker. And that's Abraham, all over it. The tabernacle. Um, I stole these uh, pictures off the Bible Project, which I absolutely love if you want to look up some of these. Um, so the more substantial dwelling where God is dwelling with his people is the tabernacle. Uh, God uh, promises to rescue his people from slavery in Egypt. So Exodus 3, at the beginning, when he first speaks to Moses, he says to Moses, I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And it's that worship word. You shall worship God on this mountain. So even before the Exodus happens and the Passover, God's intention is to redeem his people so that they will worship him on this mountain. And then Exodus 19, we see how God calls them together and the privileged position that they have. Uh, he calls them there as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. All the earth is mine, but you will be my treasured possession. Again, not a distant God watching things unfold from afar, but God is with them. And then as we get towards the end and the building of the tabernacle, uh, God says in 25, I haven't put that one on there, but 25 verse 8 to 9, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so you shall make it. So the tabernacle is built, and it's no surprise when you enter it, it would take you back to what they would have known of Eden, Colours of blues, yellows, and oranges to remind them of those creation narratives. To remember when God dwelt with them face to face. Lampstands that would look like Eden's trees. To remember when God dwelt face to face with his people. And the priests in the tabernacle, like Adam and Eve in Genesis 2, 15, same words, were to work and keep the tabernacle. Just as if it was that temple garden where God dwelt face to face. And so the tabernacle would be a physical sign of God with his people, not totally open access like Eden. God was in the Holy of Holies, that third part within the tabernacle. But God's holy presence, a holy, heavenly, fully glorious God dwelling on earth with his people. So verse 40 from Exodus, the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of God filled the tabernacle. So as you know, as you move on, I think I'd learn. Here we go. As you move on from wandering in the desert with the tent tabernacle, the temple in Mount Zion under David and Solomon in Jerusalem is built as a permanent structure uh, modeled on the tabernacle, a physical place of worship in Jerusalem. And uh, 
model on the tabernacle with the most holy place, the priests, the uh, sacrificial system, and still with all that Garden of Eden imagery, but permanent and a physical symbol of God's presence. And it's described as glorious. So 1 Kings um, 8 to 10. When the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, just like the tabernacle. That amazing picture of a creator, glorious God, stepping in to be with the earthly humans. And the glory of God was in the holies of holies. So it's not totally like Eden, where there's face-to-face open access, is it? Just like the tabernacle, they have the priesthood to intercede and mediate. You can't just uh, barge in, like my children do, to interrupt. You can't just barge into the temple. The priests uh, intercede and mediate. The sacrificial system allows you to remove sin and come before a holy, glorious God. Um, But it isn't just, the temple isn't just an office where you go to pay a fine or make a transaction, a little bit like trying to use the uh, machine down in the car park. Step one, you do this. Step two, you do that. Step three, you're in there. It's a place where the covenant relationship between God and mankind is celebrated, kept, and enjoyed, where God was worshipped and adored, served, and obeyed. And I think sometimes we lose that. It feels transactional. But think about in the Psalms and the prophets when there's festivals based on the temple, feasts. Think of David dancing up to the temple. Think of the Psalms of praise that are centered on the temple. Um, It's a symbol of past access to God, but keeping the covenant relationship ongoing. God has made Israel his people, and God, through the temple, is keeping Israel as God's people. So that lovely verse to Solomon in 1 Kings 9, I have heard your prayer and your plea, which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. This isn't just a, a, a building of bricks and stones. This is a place of adoration, of worship and joy. So when you see Adam and Eve, Abraham, Moses, Israel and the tabernacle, David, the kingdom, and the temple in Jerusalem, you see that worship is primarily relational with God. God is dwelling. He graciously reveals and redeems people. It's not forced worship. It's recognition of what God has done for them. It's gratitude, joy, and dependence. Now, what I want you to do at this point, and this is going to require standing up and getting the piece of paper, uh, perhaps if you could just get into a little group, what you're going to do is um, get one of these big bits of paper and a Sharpie pen. They're my children's that I uh, literally um, sorted out last night, so I imagine every one in five pen will not work. But come and get a picture. I want you to draw a picture of the temple. Very rough. Look, I gave you a little outline there. It's so embarrassing, I can't even show you. Um, draw just a framework of temple, and then in it, in your groups, I just want you, with my sharp pens, to write some of these ideas about what the temple represented um, from what we've just talked about. So up you come. Thank you, Joy. Doesn't have to be a work of art. No. <laughs> You don't have to draw that one. (laughs) 
this, this took me hours. So this is my representative of the temple. Stop laughing, the architect over there. Uh, and then space to um, write in between what the temple meant. Okay, just come up with some of the things that we talked about, some of your own thoughts. You're not going to be marked. Oh, no, in Old Testament, Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. Just, um, uh, just where you are, just stay where you are, and I'll um, just be really painful with the slides again. There we go. So you see, this is not what I expected you to get, but I just wanted to get the brain cells moving. So in the Old Testament, uh, you've got God's presence uh, in the temple. Heaven comes to earth. You've got God's glory represented there. Uh, you've got God's covenant world, word to his people. So if you were really au fait with Exodus, you'd see that in the Ark of the Covenant, they've got the tablets of the law and God's word to them. It's physical and external, and it's God's way of uh, people accessing God and also maintaining their covenant relationship. It doesn't just get them in to be the people of God. It keeps them going. And uh, you can see from other bits in the Bible, it's where God is praised with song, and other bits of the Bible, it implies as well that it's going to be a promise to all nations that one day the nations will gather at that temple. So you can see in the Old Testament, this temple was really key. It was um, the Old Testament believers were dependent on this physical place for their relationship with God. And the way they expressed that was through worship to him. So what happens, as you might know, spoiler alert, uh, because of their uh, disobedience, Israel uh, is exiled 
And the significance of that is that they're taken away from the temple. It's not just that they've um, got to relocate, but they're actually taken away from the temple in the most dramatic way possible. They're physically taken out of Jerusalem to Babylon, and the temple's destroyed. Such a physical wrench not to be where their God is. Uh, but it's a relational wrench as well. They're taken from the place where their God dwelled with them and where they worshipped him. It's like moving house and then being torn away from your family. And so a book like Ezekiel talks about that pain as the glory of the temple. Ezekiel sees the glory of the temple um, leave. And the prophets after the exile are then uh, prophesying about a future temple. One moment, give me 10 minutes to click. Micah's an example. I don't expect you to read all that. I know. (laughs) You need very focals. No, you need a bigger print, sorry. But let me just read. um, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the uh, house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted above the hills. The people shall flow to it, and many nations shall come and say... Uh, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. It's talking about the temple at this point is destroyed. So it's promising a time when they'll be able to go back up to Jerusalem, back up to the temple, and have it uh, reestablished. It's a prophetic hope of restoration, and it focuses on a new temple. It focuses on God being amongst his people again. It focuses on a new redemption, a new center of worship, and it also focuses on the nation's being drawn to that mountain, um, to that temple. Um, And then, what you get next? You get Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman, talking about a new place to worship uh, that is not going to be Jerusalem and is not going to be a mountain. There's going to be a few alarm bells ringing uh, for the Jews listening in to those kind of conversations. In the groups where you are, I've got some uh, questions just to make you think a little bit about the Old Testament. And the temple, um, I'll give you a couple of minutes to think. The Old Testaments were dependent on the temple for their worship and covenant relationship. It's on your sheet. So what did worship look like in the Old Testament? Uh, how does God take the initiative to reveal himself and redeem? And how, this is a nice wordy question, how does God maintain his transcendent greatness when he dwells amongst his people on the earth? Have a little think about those really massive questions in like two minutes. <sighs>
right, sorry not to give you um, much time, but uh, let's turn to John's gospel now. And it's a view from the other mountain, uh, Mount Gerizim and the Samaritan woman that Elspeth was helping us understand this morning, John 4. But before we look at John 4, uh, we're going to use some verses in John to help understand that a little bit more. Uh, let's start with John chapter 1, if you could look that up, chapter 1, verse 14. And because of our little journey through the Old Testament, some of the uh, words here will really ring true. I'll just start with verse 1. Um, John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so the literal translation of that is the word became flesh, Jesus, from God, who was God, became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled amongst us, is the, is the literal understanding. God, as Jesus, becomes man and tabernacles amongst us. And that's why that word glory is so significant, isn't it? The glory of the tabernacle, the glory of the temple, and now the glory seen in the man Jesus. And so when Jesus then dips into the subject of worship and the temple and Jerusalem in chapter 4 and says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you will worship uh, the Father. Uh, but the hour is coming and is here now when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth and the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Um, they're just coming to put the computer back on. I think the computer's um, got fed up with me and my clicker going in the wrong direction. Is, uh, oh, look, there we go. It's turned itself off. It's a little, someone up there to fix it. If only my home was like, like, was like that, you could say it's not, something's not working, someone pops up to fix it. Anyway, um, we see in John 4, don't we, the coming of Jesus radically changes how we relate to God. We're shifting from a place Jerusalem, the mountain, the temple, to a person, uh, Jesus. And we'll look at this verse in uh, a little help. The, uh, he says, the hour is coming in verse 23. Now, to understand the hour, is uh, he's not just watching his clock like I am. He's referring to something that he continually refers to, uh, John's gospel. Uh, does somebody want to, look, interaction, does someone want to look up chapter 2, verse 4, and with a really loud voice read it out for us? Yeah, lovely. Thank you. So it's the wedding at Cana, and the, um, they want Jesus to do something. He says, my time has not yet come. It's literally, my hour has not yet come. He repeats it again in uh, chapter 7. As he gets closer to his death and his, uh, his death, his betrayal. So uh, let's look at the Passover 13, verse 1. Could someone read that out? His time hadn't come in chapter 2, but by 13, verse 1. Yeah, so he's got his eye on his death and resurrection at that point. That's the hour, that's what Jesus is meaning. It's coming closer as he gets closer to his death and resurrection. So new worship, this open access worship, is centered on the hour, it's centered on uh, Jesus' death and resurrection. Let's look at that phrase, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit. So flip back to John chapter 3, 1 to 8. Uh, does somebody want to read just five um, to eight for me, of chapter three, really loudly? Thank you, Anne. So the spirit there is what's redeeming people. It's the spirit that's bringing out, bringing this uh, eternal life. And so in John, when Jesus talked about the spirit, we worship, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit, 
God is redeeming us through the Spirit so that we can worship. And then in verse 23, true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Does somebody want to uh, flick to John chapter 14, verse 6? Who's got a loud voice? Thank you so much. So God is redeeming us through his spirit and God is revealing himself through his truth, through Jesus. Jesus. So we've got this uh, constant thing in the Old Testament like God redeems and reveals himself and dwells amongst people and then in Jesus here, God is redeeming through his spirit and revealing himself through the truth of Jesus. And so God is spirit and those that worship must worship in spirit and truth. It's open access worship again. Uh, like Eden. It's not tied to a place. It's not tied to a culture. It's not tied to a religion. It blows out and explodes. God makes worship and relationship with him available to all so all um, can worship. We're beginning to see a restoration of of Eden. Uh, The tabernacle and the temple were just a shadow of that, but with the coming of Jesus, here comes Eden um, again. Are we anywhere near the... uh, PowerPoint working. Yes. One moment. Yes. It's my last slide and I did it right first time. So um, you can see that just in the, te- as with the temple, oh, I know, boasted too soon. Uh, all these things in the temple, Jesus fulfills. He does. Oh, I'm, I'm beginning to get annoyed with myself. I'm so sorry. There we go. Uh, God's presence is among us. Um, God's glory in Jesus, God's presence is still among us. God's glory is shown uh, in Jesus, John uh, 1 verse 14. Uh, God is God's word to his people in the Old Testament. It was in the Ark of the Covenant, Covenant, but Jesus is God's word. Instead of it being physical and external, it's spiritual, inward, universal, The same in the Old Testament, God's way of access is Jesus and maintaining the covenant with his people is Jesus. And God's praise with song now focus on Jesus. Think about those praise songs in Revelation 7 to the Lamb on the throne. And all nations, that Samaritan, starting with a Samaritan woman who's not Jewish, are drawn to God through Jesus. So Jesus is our our new temple um, to worship, to worship God. Right, let me, uh, if you turn over, what you can do in your groups there is, we're just going to look at some verses from Hebrews when we see how Jesus, this idea that Jesus is our new temple, and we're going to look at some verses in Hebrews that talks about Jesus relating to the sacrificial system, the holy of holies, and the high priest. So do you want to just go into your little groups now and uh, see uh, how much you can get through um, by looking up those things about Jesus now and how he fulfills what was going on in the temple through the sacrificial system, holy of holies, and the high priest.
Um, I'm really sorry to butt in, um, and they're such great verses, so if you haven't managed to get through them all, I really encourage you to look at them outside of this, but I also want to give you time just to talk together at the end. I think one of the lovely things about being together uh, with women is not just hearing from the front, but being able to hear from other people. So I'm going to talk fast so that you've got a bit of time to talk again at the end. Um, but aren't they lovely verses about Jesus, our new temple? Um, we don't need any more holy places. Our church buildings uh, are just physical buildings. They are not sacred. They are not special. We don't need any more mediators between us and God. We don't need to add anything else to being made right with God because Jesus, our high priest, our sacrifice, the one who gives us access to God, uh, is enough. There's no extra or special ways to get into the presence of God or to get closer to God. And that's worth saying that our music and singing touches the heart, doesn't it, and affects the emotion and makes us feel good, but it doesn't bring us closer to God Jesus does that. It doesn't take us into the presence of God. Jesus, the temple, has done that for us. Um, and that's why I've written on the Sunday and the 24-7. So I think on the Sunday in our worship, if we view worship just as a Sunday thing and a singing thing, it is too narrow. Um, and when we feel the passion in church on Sunday, but we feel weary in the week, remembering that it is the Lord Jesus that brings us to God gives us a steadiness, I think, in our emotional sense of how we relate to God. We aren't closer to God when we're singing. We're closer to God because of Jesus. And so when the music's not there, and when the church isn't there on Monday to Saturday, we are still close to God. We still have access to God. He is still our great high priest who is there sympathizing and interceding. And it also helps us if we just think about wrong directions, if we're thinking, what must I do? Uh, always up to praise God. Because when we're left alone in our own efforts, it's tiring. Um, but these verses about Jesus being our temple reminds us that Jesus gets us in to uh, our relationship with God and he keeps us in. Again, that high priest who intercedes with us in heaven. And it bursts into the 24-7, doesn't it? It bursts into life and into the ordinary. It bursts into worship, bursts into the ordinary, uh, into the weekday life. Uh, worship of God honors the ordinary stuff. Uh, we worship God at home, at work, at friends in the day to day. We are worshiping God when we bite our tongue and we don't say that mean thing. We are worshiping God when we go the extra mile. Uh, we are worshipping God when we forgive someone that's hurt us. We are worshipping God when we stick up for our faith. We are worshipping God when we feel weary and we're persevering in weakness. And that's 24-7 worship. Let me just say something about singing, um, because I love it. Singing praise, it is a good thing. Uh, but it should spur us on to remember Jesus and remember a God who dwells with us graciously and lovingly and helps us. Um, James uh, 5 verse 13 says, that's a nice little one. Um, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. Where is it? Uh, sorry. If anyone is sick, pray. If anyone is joyful, sing. Isn't that nice? And I think we, uh, we forget, we don't, I don't want you to hear that I don't like singing and that it's not important. It is really important. If you are full of joy, sing. Sing in the car, sing at home, sing in the kitchen. And then Ephesians, uh, sing to one another. Isn't that what we did this morning so beautifully? Ephesians 5, verses 18 uh, to 19. Addressing one another in, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody. I find the melody a bit, bit, bit hard, but singing to each other, spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart. It is so good, isn't it, to sing together for the heart, uh, and it takes our mind uh, to what Jesus um, has done for us. So um, on the back of the sheet, uh, I knew we wouldn't have time, but uh, no, it's on the bottom of the sheet, a worship checklist from Romans 12, verse 1 to 8, totally stolen from um, Vaughan Roberts' book, True Worship, uh, that might be something that you might like to think about, how uh, worship bursts into the ordinariness of the week. But I'd love you to have a bit of time together. Four minutes. That's a joy, isn't it? Uh, just to think and reflect in your groups together how Jesus is totally in the box. Jesus has totally transformed our worship categories. 
So have a think about what that means for how you think about your Sunday gatherings together. How do we worship together? How does singing and praise help us to worship God? And then also think about it in the 24-7 of Monday to Saturday. How does being a true worshipper play out in the day-to-day? Four minutes, four and a half minutes, so I can pray. I think I could have one minute of lunch. Four minutes. (laughs) Still having four. I think um, lunch, is, lunch is starting, but why don't you um, carry on those conversations over lunch? I'm sorry to rush that side of things um, and to butt in because they look like fruitful conversations. Um, let me just mention two books. Both are upstairs. Uh, True Worship by Vaughan Roberts. If you want to think about this uh, and a bit more, that's, that's a good book. Uh, you can see where I plagiarized his uh, Romans 12 checklist from. And then I really love this book. If you're interested in how the whole Bible covers these kind of themes, this is such a lovely book. Not only just because of the cover, which I also appreciate, but mostly because of the content. It takes themes and traces them uh, throughout the Bible, written by a woman too, which we love. Um, oh, yeah, should I tell you what it's called? I was, <laughs> I was a little bit appreciative of the cover. <laughs> 
even better than Eden. Nine ways the Bible story changes everything about your story. So I, for this, I read the chapter on um, the story of dwelling place. But it's also got the story of the wilderness, the tree, his image, clothing, the bridegroom, the Sabbath, offspring, dwelling place, um, and the city. Um, that's upstairs as well. Um, can I just pray? Let me just pray. Let me just pray. Heavenly Father, we started this morning thinking about how your son talked to that Samaritan uh, woman. And as people who aren't Jewish, many of us here are not Jewish, how good it is that we can worship you um, now through Jesus. Not in a place, in a temple, but through the Lord Jesus who has given us access and who helps us in the day-to-day -day life of uh, worship of you, worship of him, and worship of one another who helps us in the ordinary and what it is to serve you in this world. May the things that we've thought about today very hastily encourage us to live for you uh, in the whole week. Uh, help us not to put you on a back burner. May the music that we listen to lift our hearts and our minds and our joyfulness and our spirits to the Lord Jesus, uh, the Lamb on the throne, worthy of all worship, for he has given us salvation. We know that our worship will keep going into heaven. And so we pray that you'd help us to be good, true worshippers now with the help of your spirit and your son um, on Sundays and in the world around us, we pray in his name. Amen.